Thing and personal success. Um, we wanted to really dive into this topic as a lot of people nowadays struggle with how they're spending their money um, when, it, when something emotional takes place in their life. Um, so I'm Tyler. We have Emily, Emily, and Greg with us today who will dive deeper into their stories. And what, you, what we really want you guys to take away from this conversation is how you can relate your content to your audience um, and what you in ways that you can talk to your audience to get them to understand that it's not bad that you spend your money on certain um, things that relate to your emotional being at the time but realize what those consequences are and what you can do to kind of offset some of that spending so from there I'll pass it to Emily hello everybody I am Emily Cleaver I'm a mental health therapist by trade, so I'm really excited to be able to talk about money and emotions here at FinCon, the two things that I love the most. <laughs> <laughs> I blog about paying off my student debt at wisemindmoney.com, and I also talk about having honest money conversations with the people in your life. Um, and so we're all gonna kind of tell some personal stories here today. Just a uh, trigger warning, this is going to be filled with uh, some feels today. <laughs> so I'm glad to be starting off because my story is a little more lighthearted. And it comes from a time when I was in college. I graduated college with $78,000 in student debt. I, um, to use a term that my good friend Greg coined here, pun intended. Uh, I did not become money woke until my, <laughs> until my last semester of my um, graduate school. So at that time, it's a little bit late to go back and say, oh, now I know all about student debt and I'm not going to get into it. Uh, I've got one semester left and I can't stop now. So back when I was in undergrad, I'm going to... Uh, show you guys some actual tweets that I tweeted. <laughs> so these are, I was, I started undergrad in 2009 and I graduated in December of 2013. You can see that four out of five of these tweets are from 2013, so I'm thinking maybe that was a little bit of a rough year for me. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite tip up here is to keep six cents in your checking account so that you don't spend money. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I loved college. I loved everything about college. I loved the learning. I am not kidding when I say I loved the assignments. I loved writing papers. I loved the parties, as you can probably <laughs> see up here. <laughs> and so, that was one thing that I prioritized a lot when I was in college. Um, if, I, if you were to go back in time and tell 2013 Emily that she would be speaking at a personal finance conference, she would go totally Kelly Kapoor on you and say, first of all, how dare you? <laughs> um, and she would say, what? I don't know anything about money. Um, I would, public speaking also, no, that's not possible. <laughs> and I'm still kind of saying that right now. Um, but the difference between now and then, kind of when I look back and think about how I was spending in college and what I was spending on, the one emotion that I can really pinpoint was fear. And I, I had a lot of fear of missing out. So everyone knows the acronym FOMO. Uh, I had a lot of FOMO. If I, I was not about to miss a party in college, and I was not about to miss something that I had to buy an outfit for because I didn't buy an outfit. Um, I got new clothes for like every party. Um, <laughs> You can see that I was really trying to be thrifty by downgrading to the marathon for my alcohol instead of Kroger. <laughs> um, but I didn't recognize that fear was a big emotion at the time. Um, the fear of not belonging, the fear of not being 
kind of seen as cool when I was in college and not being out where everybody else was. And so if you would have asked me at that time, I totally would have denied it too because like I said, I loved college. I didn't feel fearful. Um, but now looking back, I realized that that was a big driver of my spending when I was in college. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic on to Emily, but that was my story of money and emotions. Um, hi, I'm Emily Guy Birkin. I am a Plutus Award winning freelancer. <laughs> um, uh, I've been freelancing since 2010. Um, and so my um, story of money and emotion is kind of, um, it's also about missing, but uh, it's not a fear of missing out exactly. So that right there is my dad, Jim Guy, and my son, Ari, uh, as of uh, around this time, 2010. Um, and so my father, um, who was like the world's greatest grandpa, but he really was, I know they have lots of you know, shirts and, and mugs that say that, um, he was diagnosed with a glioblastoma in uh, October of 2012, and he passed away in April of 2013. And uh, so this is the, the feels portion of the, uh, <laughs> of the show. Um, so my, at the time, um, I was pregnant with my second son, who was named James, for, for my dad. And um, uh, I was married, had a career. Uh, I was 34 years old. My older sister was 37. My dad was 62. Um, and uh, my dad had a life insurance policy that, was, uh, um, that my sister and I were the beneficiaries of. Um, and he very much intended that to be a gift to us. He wanted that to be something uh, like a, a last way to um, be good to us. Uh, and I thought that I was being extremely rational um, by trying to use the money to go towards things that my dad would approve of. Um, I, so I was, okay, I'm going to send um, uh, some to my kids' 529s, I'm going to put some in my retirement fund, I'm going to give to charity, those are all things dad would approve of. Um, even though I could even hear in my head my dad going, do something nice for yourself, Emily. And in addition to that, that sense that I had to do something good with the money that dad would approve of, even knowing rationally that he meant for it to be a gift for me to enjoy this money, uh, I also found myself, and this is something only personal finance people will understand, tying myself in knots going, I should find out if it was term life insurance or whole life insurance. Because if it was whole life insurance, I would have gotten the money when dad like lived another 30 years. But if it's term life insurance, I have to feel guilty about it. <laughs> so, um, and that, that I just kind of went in these circles around and around, um, and it took me uh, a while to recognize how irrational my responses were because I was doing um, quote unquote good things with the money, um, you know, and, and I was kind of moralizing what I chose to do with this money that my dad intended as a gift. And so since we often think of um, emotional financial decisions as the kind of like binge shopping or, you know, doing things that are going to hurt your bottom line, I had trouble recognizing just how emotional I was in the wake of losing my dad and, and receiving this gift from him and um, making choices uh, with that money that had all to, everything to do with grief and very little to do with um, my, my rational choices of how it was going to best serve my life. Yeah, um, uh, my name's Greg Gates Jr. I'm at uh, Greg Chats Cash, and my, my story is a little bit about my dad as well. Um, uh, what I would say is, first off, I, I think Saturday at FinCon is a really good time to consider our emotions. I'm not sure if the rest of you got as little sleep as I have, <laughs> but when we're functioning this way, just think about the choices here in the room we've made over the course of the last day or two. How much of our financial choices we've made are tied to how little sleep we got. Just <laughs> throwing that out there. Um, but uh, with my story, uh, I come from a background of not having very much financial education at all. In fact, once I was out of school, uh, I left college and decided I'd go out into the woods and work in the woods because I could avoid these systems that I didn't want to be a part of out there. Well, <laughs> they still exist out there. Um, <laughs> because every time I would work with kids out in the woods, I would come back and, you know, didn't have to pay much in room and board. So my paychecks were 
It would serve me well during my downtime. I could travel, be nomadic. And so I found myself traveling around uh, with my then girlfriend, now partner. Um, as we traveled, every time we would stop for gas, I would go into the gas station and buy a drink, buy a soda, fill up, and keep going. And then, you know, when next time we stop for gas, go in, buy something, keep going. And I found myself, it was in the middle of Kentucky, I have a very vivid memory of this, where we had just stopped like an hour ago for the bathroom break. I'd bought stuff, and it was an hour later we needed to stop again. We weren't being efficient at that time, and we stopped for gas then. And I went into the store to buy stuff again when I had just bought stuff that I hadn't even opened that was in the car. And I had this moment of like, why am I doing this? And it was this aha moment, I'm getting chills now, because as a kid, I was raised by a single mom and had a slightly absentee father. And when he would show up, he would whisk us away and take us on travels. And on our travels, every time we stopped, we could get whatever we wanted. And so there was this emotional tie to that event that I didn't put together for decades. And in that moment, standing in that Kentucky parking lot, I was like, I, I guess I'm just gonna get back in the car and go. <laughs> um, and so for me, coming to this personal finance later on, I've come from it from a background of behavioral health and therapy and alternative education. So I avoid things like numbers, charts, and graphs as often as possible because it's about healthy habits. It's about having these aha moments, whether they're big or small, in our emotional choices and decision making and trying to figure out where to go from there. And so I found myself, as I traveled a lot more, figuring out ways to be like a little more frugal and being more accountable with my partner, making sure that she was aware of this event too, because this social positive peer pressure accountability is super important. Um, and so that's kind of how I've been approaching it. And hopefully a little bit later, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about how you can approach your content as well based on that. But for my travels, a large part of that was how can I, um, as I came back front country again, how can I figure out ways to support other people in recognizing their familial history as it's tied to money as well? And on to me. Um, so I'm Tyler from When the Money's Good, and in these pictures, I look really, really happy. Like, I was, that was so much fun. I don't know if you've ever been to Costa Rica, but if you do, definitely do a four-wheel trek. That was, okay. Anyway. Um, but in this moment, literally maybe two hours after this, I completely broke down. My grandmother had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, excuse me, in August of 2017. And that was a really defining moment in my life. Um, so in Costa Rica in April of 2018, I completely broke down because she had just passed in January of 2018. Um, when I decided to go on this trip, I was really kind of thinking about why am I doing this? Like, I just want to go. I don't care about anything anymore. I want to get away from where I am right now. Um, so I just need to go somewhere. And I, I debated with it. My mom was like, I'll give you money to go. I just want you to have fun. I want you to be in a better place. And I was just like, mom, like I can't, I don't have the money to, to spend to go on this trip. Um, but she broke me down, and after a while, I just said, okay, forget it. I'm going to go. I'm going to pay for it myself. She actually didn't give me that $300 that she promised me, but <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but I ended up kind of going in or putting myself into debt for this trip. But why did I do it? Basically because I was trying to get away from that feeling of losing a family member. Um, and so now we'll kind of go into that emotional versus rational thinking and decision making that, you know, we get to when we have some kind of void in our life or when we have an emotional connection from travels that we did or from being in school. Um, and I'll allow Greg to go further into that concept. Yeah, so um, I, I think it's really important that, uh, I, well, as I came to this, uh, like I said, a little bit later to the financial world, um, coming from a therapeutic background, when I came across behavioral economics, I was like, wait, this is new? <laughs> like, we're just learning about how our personalities and our, we're not econs? Like, yeah, duh. Um, and so uh, when we look at emotional versus rational decision making, uh, recognizing that most of the things that 
uh, the folks that we're working with, uh, the folks that we're creating content for, are con and, and ourselves, are constantly making, whether it's small emotional or grand emotional decisions, and oftentimes we're really good at rationalizing those decisions in the moment, especially when we're doing it isolated and by ourselves. And so when I come to this, I think, how can I provide a platform where it's okay to discuss the emotional side of money in a way that feels open. And so, uh, as far as, yeah, mindset. So, yeah, I, this is a topic that's very close to my heart. Uh, my, the name of my blog is Why is Mind Money? And where that comes from is the concept of wise mind, is this state of mind. And it's a part of a therapy called dialectical behavior therapy where there are a few different states of mind. You've got your logical mind, your emotion mind, and then your wise mind. And the wise mind is a combination or a balance of the logical and the emotional. So how this looks personally for me, just an example is when I'm in my logic mind, thinking about paying off my student debt. Logic tells me if I want to pay that off as quickly as possible, I have to put all of my extra money toward my student loans, and I cannot go out to eat. I can't travel. I can't pay to go to FinCon. Um, <laughs> and I have to put every extra dollar that I get toward my student loan debt, and that's just the logical way to pay it off as quickly as possible. Whereas my emotion mind says, but I want to go out to eat all the time. I like going out to eat and I love going to conferences and I want to travel. And so I only have to pay the minimum uh, payments on my student debt. Why wouldn't I just do that and then use the other money to do whatever I want to do? And so my wise mind state of mind is a combination and a balance between those two that says, okay, I want to pay my student loans off quickly, and it's going to be bad for my emotional health if I deprive myself of all the things that I love in life. And so I have to find the balance between what's a high priority for me paying off debt, what are other high priorities for me hanging out with my friends, going out to eat every once in a while, and where's the balance in between those things. And that's where you get um, into that state of mind that is wise mind. And so what are some of the ways that uh, we as content creators or coaches or advisors can relate this information to our audience um, and make it okay, basically, to spend what they want to spend? So one of the things that I think is really important um, and is part of the reason why like this this conference has become so big um, is uh, sharing personal stories. Um, you know, the, the FinCon is, is kind of a disruptor in the financial industry and that's partially because the financial industry prior to blogging was, you know, guys in suits telling you, you know, plus, minus, black ink, red ink, you know, it's real simple, you know, don't spend what you don't earn, and, and, uh, and, and the very, very easy, like, well, it's, it's simple, if you just do this, then that will happen. Um, and so one of the reasons why that um, kind of turned people off and um, frightened people away from the financial industry is because that's not actually how money works. Um, and it's, it, okay, it may be simple, but that doesn't make it easy. Um, and so making it clear that even those of us who are financial professionals struggle with this um, and have these irrational reactions to money and um, spend money emotionally or save money emotionally. Because um, again, that's, a, that's, that's the other thing, to recognize when you are being a miser um, for an emotional reason um, rather than a spender for an emotional reason. Uh, that can kind of allow your your readers, your audience to say, I see myself in, in what you're talking about. I see my own um, spending habits in what you're talking about. And you're a financial professional and you are telling me that this happens to you too and that there are ways to, 
to work around these emotional um, issues. There are ways to get to that wise mind um, rather than um, just kind of always falling victim to our emotions and then either beating ourselves up or rationalizing those decisions and you know constantly struggling from from one crisis to the next so you know that personalization that recognition that we all are all starting over day one every single day uh, with a, a potential emotional um, money decision yeah um, uh, along the lines of the money decisions uh, those of us who are content creators I, I being fairly newer to the field, especially in the last three years, I recognize, wow, as soon as we bring up any type of terminology that has the word money in it, red flags, radars go up for anyone who hasn't met us yet. And so I think that's a big part of why our personal stories have helped us attach. And it's not just about sharing your story, I think it's just as much about the other person, the listener, recognizing you as a human being. And I think that's a huge part of this is, even if you're not sharing your personal details, how can you share your humanity so that that emotional conversation can happen? Because I'm not gonna share my emotional um, difficulties with someone that I can't feel trust with. And so what does it look like to build that trust? And so for content creators, how can we ask more questions rather than just providing information? How can we get to know our um, community directly? Um, uh, for example, I, instead of making YouTube videos when I started, I started on Snapchat because people could swipe up and comment and I could get into the direct messages right away. And it wasn't just a presentation, it was a conversation, which at some point also we're definitely going to do questions because as content creators we want to help you all as well. Um, and with the uh, emotional history, one of the other conversations is for those of you who are writing about families, partnerships, marriages, that emotional history is extremely different for both of those people. And so when they come together, that can be extremely powerful. I know that there are plenty of marriage counselors who, the divorces, right? Money is a significant reason for divorce. And it's not just what happened in the moment, it's what happened up until then. It's that they were, uh, many couples never reconcile that moment of, oh, we think about money completely differently, so we have to come to a place of compromise and recognize our historical baggage. Because our habits are formed, are, you know, we are our habits, and our habits are formed by our history. So really trying to break that down a little bit, and of course it gets with those community members, it gets into those fields, and sometimes they don't just happen in your presentations, in your comments, in your blogs. That's when you have to get one-on-one, -on -one, which can be really, really powerful and important. And I think that's a, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. And I, I want to say I think that's a great point. Um, Rachel on Wednesday, excuse me, talked about not being the hero in somebody else's story, but allowing them to be the hero in theirs. So if you can relate yourself to somebody else, and then they say that, oh wow, this is relatable information and I can take this information back to wherever um, and kind of do with it what I please, then they're the hero in their story and it, it's for it literally tailored to them. So, so we'll, um, uh, building on what you're saying about uh, people bringing their own uh, money histories, the thing that I think we have a really hard time remembering is that money is not an immutable fact of nature. Um, you know, money doesn't exist in nature. Um, the, the little green pieces of paper we all have in our wallets have value because we have all collectively decided that they have value. And if you think about it, that is really weird. <laughs> I mean, really bizarre. Um, and so, and that, because of that, that means that it is, money is, uh, um, open to our own interpretation of it. We put our moral, our emotional, our philosophical views on money. So the same amount of money in my wallet means something different to me than it does to my husband, that it does to my kids, that it does to everyone in this audience because of our full histories. And because our society doesn't acknowledge that, because if we acknowledge that and we'd acknowledge how weird it is that we've all collectively decided this stuff is valuable, then um, uh, that means that we 
we are much more likely to make irrational decisions and have trouble recognizing when our emotions are driving our financial decisions because we are still thinking of this like, oh yeah, money, that's, that's, a, that's a natural thing, that's something that everyone needs to master, blah, 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 without talking about, that means a different thing for each person. Like money is idiosyncratic and we don't recognize that fact. Right, um, and just really quickly, one thing that I know very well is that mental health has a stigma attached to it, and so does talking about money. Mm -hmm. And I think that all of us in this room are working really hard to break that stigma just by talking about money and having money conversations. And that's such an important thing, is for people to hear real people talk about money topics. Um, and so one way that I try to bring that, not just in my internet life and on my blog, but into my real life is I try to have honest, real money conversations with the people around me, with my peers who I know also have student loans and with my, um, with my coworkers about our salaries and our situations at work and with my family to help kind of break that stigma of talking about money and the more conversations that we're having about money with people in our lives, the easier it's going to be for them to, do, to go and take those conversations to the people in their lives and to break that stigma that's around talking about money. So it's funny you should say that because I'm... I'm uh, um, oh, did you repeat the question? Oh. So um, he's uh, not a content creator. He's um, um, putting together an app about mindfulness around money, and he wanted to know our, our view of, uh, of how mindfulness fits into money and, and this question of emotional wealth. Um, so I would say it's funny you should say that. I, I am right now talking to my publisher about possibly putting together a book on money mindfulness. Um, so I have been thinking about this quite a bit. Um, and so for, for me, um, the, the important thing about mindfulness is to accept what, you're, what you feel in the moment that you feel it and um, putting a, um, a pause between stimulus and response. So like it's very easy. I had a bad day. I'm going to the mall. I'm, okay, malls don't exist anymore, but I had a bad day. <laughs> I'm going on Amazon. Um, and, uh, and so it's very easy for that stimulus, like I feel bad and you want the response, you know, you want the, like I want to feel better, retail therapy is going to help. And so the mindfulness is to be like, okay, I had a bad day. I'm going to sit with that for, let's say, five minutes and just sit with my bad day. Um, and so that's, for me, um, the mindfulness around money is really about mindfulness around emotion. Um, and it's similar like when you talk about mindfulness with, and food and, um, and breaking any other kind of um, bad cyclical habits is take that moment. So for me, I personally am a, a big, I mean, I'm a writer, so I'm, I'm a big believer in writing things down. Um, I'm a big believer in journaling. And so if you find yourself, you know, you've, you've made this goal, like I do not want to spend money um, that I can't afford anymore, um, and you know, like you immediately like, oh, I, I, I had a bad day, or I'm celebrating, or whatever it is, and I want to go buy something, you know, and you feel that little guilt because that's that's what happens. People will feel guilty because their reaction is, I want to spend money. Um, so stop, you know, rather than do do what you want to do and feel the guilt. Stop, write down like what's going on, what are you feeling, why are you feeling it, how would buying something help. How would buying something hurt? And like really like grapple with your own emotions and where you are. And that, that can bring uh, the, the peace of, of you know, letting your emotions wash over you because often we are just trying to push them away and, and buying things can be a, a way of doing that. Or even you know, putting, putting your, your father's uh, gift in investments and your son's 529s in charity is a way of pushing away that feeling rather than letting it sit with you and allowing yourself to feel it. Um, and so for me, it's all about having that pause and recognizing when you need to pause and what you can do to allow yourself to feel. Mm. Uh, if I could just chime in on that, uh, pardon, uh, just with the mindfulness, the other thing uh, I try to focus on is, uh, many of us are familiar with, for example, the latte factor. Um, this idea of going from buying a coffee that's expensive to brewing your own at home isn't as simple as that action. You're changing that person's entire routine, entire day. So what does it look like as you're developing this mindfulness to create a path of 
uh, acceptance. So, okay, instead of buying the largest latte, you buy the smallest latte. You switch to drip coffee because we don't want to interrupt your daily routine and we want you to have these small wins along the way and not just be, be completely discouraged when you're like, I just get him so frustrated because I can't make coffee at home. Those little things about leading your, um, leading your, your community down the path towards mindfulness and not just saying, change that. Good luck. Um, and along those lines uh, with the decision making, I often say 24-7, 365. Uh, if you really want it, put it off for 24 hours. And in that 24 hours, have a conversation with someone about it. If it's a bigger ticket purchase, seven days. Have many conversations about that. Also, in all of those purchases, what is that going to do a year from now? Is that purchase going to help you 360 days from now? Like maybe going out with your friends for the weekend will, right? Maybe going out and being with family and spending a little more going to dinner is a good choice and you're okay with that. But trying to think of little ways to walk them through those steps of mindfulness. So you asked what the vehicle, what best vehicle to engage the audience with this conversation, basically? Okay. So, well, so I, I think it, it, a lot of it, it depends on the audience. Um, so uh, again, I'm a writer, so I write, and my audience are readers. Um, but I don't get, I can't reach everyone as a reader. I'm also a former educator, so I'm very much, I, I recognize that different students need different um, um, methods of, of learning. Um, and so and so that's one of the reasons why it's a good idea to kind of diversify whatever content you have. So you know for some people reading a blog post will be great and that they'll, they'll get something from that. For other people having Snapchat that they can interact with um, is, is what they need. For other folks watching a video is going to be perfect. Um, for still others they'd want something interactive like a, a quiz, you know BuzzFeed style quiz. Those can teach a lot of things and can be really helpful because we like so you answer all these questions and like, hey, this is this this explains a lot about me, and you know, and so so a lot of it has to deal with uh, who your audience is, and some of it is like generational. If you're working with college students, they are going to be both used to and more open to um, more technological type stuff than if you're writing to, for boomers um, or or creating content for boomers. But recognizing that you're not going to reach everyone with any one particular type of of uh, content. Content um, is is really important, and then just being open to finding other ways of reaching your your intended audience. And I would, oh, I'm sorry, I would just jump off of that and also say that this stuff is really personal for people, and so a way, if you're going to get somebody to trust you and to start having this conversation. I don't think that it necessarily matters what platform you use, but one of the important things to remember is to make it personal for them. So I would say, you know, if somebody is contacting you through a comment or a DM or something like that, if you answer them and reply to them, and if you're having that conversation back with them, they're going to be more willing to continue the conversation. And I think that if your audience sees you interacting with others who are bringing things up, that's gonna encourage them to jump into the conversation too. And nothing's more beautiful than seeing some of your followers or audience members interacting with each other because of something that you started. And I think that like, if you keep the thought in mind where you, you try to meet people where they are, period, um, and if this was to span across the entire financial community, then I think we would all reach more people that way um, as far as just like doing it where you already are. So if you're on blogs, if you do vlogs, if you do a podcast, like wherever that is, um, that's your audience is, I think, automatically going to um, gravitate toward it because it's something that's personable. Um, and just that whole concept of telling the story and, and being able to relate back to your audience. I think people will just flock to wherever you are, whatever platform you are. Yeah, um, with, with that, uh, just multiple forms of communication. 
Um, whether you're a writer, audio, video, however you create content or however you're building a community, um, consider having multiple channels for how they can contact you. For example, if you have a comment section that's public, people get excited to share their perspectives sometimes or their tips and tricks, but you also want to make sure that they feel like your audience has an avenue to talk to you privately because these Conversations are so hard. Um, I think another platform along the lines of making those real connections, uh, I have no association with them, but I've been very impressed with what Next Genvest is doing because they're assigning human people in college with those people who are up and coming from college and they're getting connected through text messaging. So any time of day, they, can, they have their, uh, their mentor uh, helping them with everything from FAFSA to how, to how to get scholarships to even what to do on campus because they're tying them in directly with people. Oftentimes, first-generation college students, this is such a great access. So figuring out ways to develop those communication channels, not just the content output channels. So I, I'm not familiar with that uh, um, uh, that particular platform. Um, I will say one of the things that I think is really important if uh, if there there's a place for, for comments is to be um, a uh, fierce curator of comments. Mm. Um, uh, there is there is this um, like back and forth between whether you want comments completely open or if you want to be a fierce curator and I think when it comes to things that are so personal and it's so easy for people to start piling on to be like make it clear that um, this is a safe space for people to talk about their money issues. Um, any any uh, 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 abuse or, or piling on or anything like that will not be tolerated uh, and just make it clear what your expectations are and then that allows people to open up um, so like it is entirely possible to have spaces online that are open that way um, and if for whatever reason you feel like you need your comment section to be much be freer than that that you can't be a curator of your, of your uh, uh, comment section then having those kind of direct like if you need help contact us directly. Um, I think that even with that though, it's uh, if people see like um, commenters, you know, making fun of other commenters for being 30K in debt or anything like that, you're going to automatically have people kind of like, oh, I, I'm, I don't want to share. Uh, even if there is a direct line. Um, so when it comes to money discussions, I think it's really important to make it clear what you will not tolerate among comments and make it clear that this is a supportive space. Um, and I also think that it's important to realize that we cannot be everything to everybody and we're not going to be able to encourage or convince everyone to share and talk about this on our platforms but you can encourage people to find resources that are local to them and to be able to go out into their world around them and get whatever these other people who are commenting um, and who are having the conversations with your platform, where might they be able to get that in their own community? So having some kind of resource page for them or having a way for them to look up where they might go that's local or even um, I'm sure there are like some national hotlines and things like that that they can go to as well. The, um, the other thing I want to point out is you never know who's reading. Uh, like I'm a long time comment lurker. Um, I, uh, you know, a long time lurker, uh, first time commenter. Uh, that, that's, that's me. Um, and so like, uh, and I know that there are other people who are like that who never comment but they read everything. Um, and it does make changes to them and for whatever reason like because they're private or, or, or um, you know, for the, or they have a job that they know that they can't be, uh, can't I can't publicly post about things for whatever reason. People will not comment, but they will learn from the commenters, from what you are pu putting out there, and, and it will make a difference to them because you, you never know who's reading, you never know what they're taking away from it. So you want to always put out the best information you have and the best um, support that you can offer. Okay, so I saw two. Okay, well with that we'll kind of go, um, Emily has some I guess concepts and statistics you would like to share. So I'm uh, I, I'm very much about like I want to I want to bring the receipts. Um, so you know this is like we're not all making this stuff up. Um, <laughs> So um, 
for instance, um, I, I, I am a bit of a behavioral finance nerd. I got into, part of the reason why I got into financial writing was because I was so interested in behavioral economics. Um, sociology was kind of a gateway for me, uh, reading sociology books, and the book uh, The Paradox of Choice was the first time I ever really understood that some of the things that I had um, experience, there was a reason for it, and there was like they, they did some scientific research into it. So, one of the things um, that is important is the affect heuristic, um, and so that's the 50 cent word for the way you feel about something um, reflects how you, uh, um, uh, how, how your decision on ma uh, making it. So, um, so if you're feeling excited about an investment, <coughs> Bitcoin, um, you are less likely to believe that it is going to be risky. Um, if you're not feeling excited about something, you're more likely to overestimate the risks. Um, so one of the things that happens is um, with the affect heuristic, for instance, um, people who are in uh, areas that are prone to earthquakes, they are much more likely to buy earthquake insurance just after an earthquake because, oh my goodness, they've just experienced it. And they're likely to let their uh, insurance lapse as the years go by. But if you know anything about earthquakes, you know that they become more, more likely the longer that goes between earthquakes. So that, again, is, is that affect heuristic the fact that your um, your uh, feelings about the risk um, or likelihood of something is affected in part by how you uh, your emotions. So if you're feeling fearful about uh, an earthquake, you're more likely to buy earthquake insurance. Yeah. So um, scarcity is a really important um, concept, particularly for anyone who is helping folks uh, who uh, have lower income. Uh, so the, the book Scarcity by uh, Sendel Malanathan and Eldar Shafir uh, is a phenomenal book that I highly recommend. Uh, they talk about two different things that happen when, you're, um, when, when you are experiencing scarcity. One of them is tunneling, and anyone who has ever written a paper the night before it's due has experienced this. <laughs> um, and so what tunneling is, you have trouble focusing on anything outside of the immediate problem. So um, I, I have time scarcity, and so I tend to tunnel on like, oh, I have to get this article done. And so I have never actually not picked him up, but I can forget that I need to go pick my son up from school because I'm so focused on that. If you are so focused on like, oh my goodness, I don't have enough money for rent. How am I gonna get rent? How am I gonna get rent? You might forget oh, the utility bills are due next week. So that is how people get stuck in a cycle of paycheck to paycheck and also um, payday lending um, because you are so focused on the particular problem in front of you that you forget that there are other problems also coming on the horizon. Um, just uh, with these ideas as well, I think these are really important points to also consider how to deliver these ideas to your audience as mm -hmm. well so that they can understand like, oh, everyone is like this mm -hmm. um, because it's very easy to get isolated in these biases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the other aspect of, about scarcity go ahead, um, is uh, there's something called the bandwidth tax. So your bandwidth is the amount of um, brain space that you can give to something. And so um, not having enough money actually reduces your IQ by up to 13 points. And that difference is the difference between you after a full night's sleep and you after an all-nighter. So if you can remember any time you've pulled an all-nighter and the stupid things you've done, compare that to you know after a full night's sleep. And that is what it is like to be consistently without money. Um, you are constantly working with, uh, with less uh, of your brain power to be able to make good decisions. Um, and so this is, again, another really important thing in recognizing that like we often look at poverty as some sort of moral failing of the people who are poor, when a lot of times what's going on is entirely understandable because of uh, what happens in our brains. So is day, day four on. <laughs> so, well, is there any way to get those 13 points back? <laughs> um, get more money. No, I, no. I, it's actually. Um, so I'm going to do a little plug. My my most recent book and financial stress now. Um, what you need is to build slack into your your budget. So they talk about building slack into time budgets and building slack into money budgets. Um, now a lot of times when it's when you talk about finding more money in your budget, it's 
really useless, like buy generic toilet paper and, and bank the savings or quit your lattes. <laughs> um, and so the uh, finding actual amounts of money that will increase your, um, your, your monthly nut is really what's going to be helpful. And in my book, I talk about uh, seven actionable ways that anyone can do that will actually um, help free up, um, you know, up to $200 or $400 a month. Um, and those are the sorts of things that can actually help with that bandwidth tax. But if you are consistently, um, chronically, uh, without money, no, you can't get those 13 IQ points back. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so one of my favorites is the, the what the hell effect, um, which we've all experienced. Um, I am much more likely to experience it in the, uh, the uh, cookie department, where like I'm not going to have any cookies at the party. <laughs> I had one. Well, what the hell? I might as well have cheesecake, too. So um, the what the hell effect is like once you have broken a rule you have given yourself, you give yourself permission to just keep breaking the rule. And so, and that happens in so many different areas of our lives. Um, and so, it's important to recognize that you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to um, be a, a like perfectly um, frugal person. You don't have to be um, perfect on your diet. You don't have to be perfect on exercise. You just need to be. Um, committed to it. So like if you slip up and you buy a purse that you didn't need or um, you spend money that you didn't need, instead of saying, what the hell, I'm, I'm bad at this anyway, I might as well keep spending, just stop and say like, this is better than it could be. So an example of that could be at FinCon last night when I said, okay, I have to be over here because I want to watch my friends present at nine o'clock the next day. I'm going to go home by midnight. And then midnight rolls around, and then 12.30 rolls around, and I'm like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> Might as well stay out till 3. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and with that, we'll kind of wrap it up. Um, if you guys have any other questions after the session, feel free to um, chat with us. We'll be up here. And please reach out to us. Uh, um, yes. There, I, many different biases to talk about uh, and these areas are so great for our content right mm -hmm. and if you want to like keep the conversation going um, hashtag emotional wealth um, and add us in that conversation so when money's good why is my money Greg chats cash that is a mouthful by the way. <laughs> and Emily Guy Birkin uh, thank you guys so much for coming out thank you.